Hi, everyone. So, uh, welcome to Ruby Tuesday and JavaScript Benang number three. So, uh, this meetup is probably brought to you by um, KL Ruby Brigade and uh, Kuala Lumpur JavaScript Group. So, there's two links there. You can go to the Ruby Malaysia meetup link or the um, Kuala Lumpur JS um, Facebook group. So Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi for this space is uh, settlement guest, and the password is settle in, all small letters. Good. So the sponsor for our event is Settlements. So they have a very cool co-working space in Penang, and then do check them out in uh, HTTP uh, settlements dot work. Okay. So let's. The music. And then um, I'm Gui. Um, I'm the organizer of Ruby Meetup in um, Ruby Tuesday in Penang and also JavaScript Meetup. Um, so, anyone here is a programmer? Programmer? Okay. First time? First time? First time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, you're from. I, I, sorry, I don't know anything about JavaScript. Okay. It's Ruby. Very uh -huh. things. Just join in to Just see. Just join to know because I'm looking for a CTO actually for my okay. uh, new setup for the company. Cool, cool, cool. So, so good. That's fine. Yep, great. So, um, for the first stop, we will have implementing a tracking fix. So by Tristan. So Tristan, are you there? Yeah, I am here. Cool. So yeah, can take it away. Am I? Am I on the? Yeah, you're on the screen. You are on the big screen. Oh, I like. I'm here in the hospital right now. There you go. Alright, cool. Alright, can anyone see my screen? Yep. Yep, everyone see it clearly. Seeing, uh, starting the slideshow. Maybe I'm not going to do the slideshow in, in, instead. I'm just going to like, go to the to the uh, slides like this because it's already loaded. So yeah, I presented this uh, a week ago and I'm, I want to present it again because I feel that a lot of people uh, should really uh, like find out about this because I have a, a story at the end as well. So I'm Tristan. You can find me Parasquid everywhere else, uh, GitHub, Facebook, on Twitter, not as much on Twitter as well. Uh, there is this application called conf.pw. You can go to conf.pw slash myjsrb3 and you can ask questions there or maybe later we can also do a, a live question and answer if you want to do more about, like think about your question first on your phone, then you can just go there. So it's a bit of a backstory on this, uh, on this thing. Uh, what we do is we do a lot of client-side applications like this, for example, this is called My Valley Home, and it's backed by a Rails application. And one of the features that we were trying to do was something called a master class. Now we were doing, we were working with a third party before that we just uh, acquired, and one of the things that we needed to do was to find out how much did people buy after going through a master class or a webinar in this case. And because we were implementing it in our own product, the issue was that we had to also re-implement the tracking pixel in order to track when someone actually buys through the checkout page. And so, okay, let's, I said, let's do that. And I was a bit surprised when my team said that they have no idea how to implement the tracking pixel and that they've never actually implemented the tracking pixel before. They, all they did was before was to have a Google uh, Google tracking pixel like GTM or Google AdSense or Google uh, advertisement or like heap analysis or whatever. They just put it on the page and that's your tracking pixel. But actually how it works, they don't know. And so I thought maybe I should make a test project and I should also try and see if I can teach of this old art of tracking pixels from before, why it's called a tracking pixel, and all of the ideas behind why it works. So in order to understand a tracking pixel, we first have to understand what 
the underlying technologies are. And the underlying technologies of what we're working with is HTTP. You might, uh, you might have heard about HTTP, it's a stateless protocol. It means every new request comes without any idea of what the previous request was. So no records are kept for every connection, and each connection is agnostic about the state of the other. If, for example, I request a document once, if I request that document again, the server would consider me as a new request and has no idea that I was the same client that requested that document from before. Uh, it doesn't, the advantages of this is that the server does not actually have to maintain the synchronization logic. So you don't have to keep records of which client has connected before and which clients are the same. The client is the one that is doing this. This is great for example for intermittent connections when for example you're trying to access a page and then you go through a tunnel so you're not connected anymore and then you come out of the tunnel and you try to connect again so since the server did not actually lose you because it always loses you at the end of every connection it's fine uh, as long as the protocol of the client and the client maintains that synchronization logic it's all good it makes it easy to cache because since the server has no idea who you are or like what the client is, any other server can uh, can step in in place of that particular server. So that's why you have all of these CDNs, content delivery networks, which stand in place of your server. You will have a proxy server, for example, like Quid, which stand in place of your server. It's because for each new request, the server doesn't care whether it's the same person or the same client or it's a different client. So it makes it very, very scalable in terms of the infrastructure of the server side. So there are different ways of maintaining state that uh, this is not an exhaustive list. So we, one of the things that uh, you might have immediately thought of would be cookies to maintain state. But before cookies, there were like URL parameters. So you might see, for example, uh, in WordPress, let's say, uh, you will always have you know, not WordPress, like even before that, like in other PHP programs, once you log in, you will receive a token, and that token is appended as a URL parameter for every request you make for that server. And that's how the server uh, remembers you, because you're sending the token over and over every part of the connection. There's also something like IP binding. So let's say, uh, this, again, this way before, we actually ran out of IPv4 addresses, one device can be uh, considered like this, like one IP can be mapped directly to one device. And so we can consider, for example, one IP connecting to your, uh, to your server and the server would see, okay, is this from the same IP? I would assume that this is from the same device. And that's how we would track it. Of course, in this uh, era that we already ran out of the IPv4 addresses, uh, and we don't actually have good infrastructure to support IPv6, this is not a very uh, good way of tracking. Another way, another way of tracking would be hidden form fields. So this is if you're doing Rails, for example, in Ruby, you might or maybe Node uh, Express, you might have this thing called the CSRF uh, meta tags for cross site. Uh, resource forgery, uh, an anti cross type uh, resource forgery. So it's similar in uh, function. The server will send inside the page a uh, hidden form field, let's say, like including a token, or maybe part of the body it will write a particular token. And then every form that you submit will need to include that particular token in order for the server to identify that you were the same client that sent the request few minutes ago, for example. So there are both tokens. Uh, and for this particular session, we will be talking more about cookies and also some other ways of tracking. So uh, this is a, a screenshot of the code that I will be showing you or then demonstrate you later on. This is actually the classic pixel tracker. I'm calling it classic because this is where the pixel tracker came from. This uh, Base64 64, Base64 encoded string is actually this, the binary encoded version of one by one pixel that's in PNG format. 
So this particular uh, request, this is actually Sinatra by the way, but this should be very similar to uh, how Express does it. The pixel.png, what will happen is that before the server actually gives you the actual image, it will intercept the request, do whatever it needs to do, like find out about, like maybe record this particular transaction first, uh, intercept the cookies, and then send the actual image. And it's called classic again because this is a one by one uh, pixel. There are other pixels, uh, pixel trackers, but they're not really a pixel. Uh, this is an iframe pixel tracker. So the pixel tracker has kind of popped on because this was the, the previous one, the one by one PNG or GIF before it was a GIF. Uh, this was the way pixel trackers have been operating for a long time until some people started to do iframe pixel trackers. And what would happen actually is that if, for example, a client prevents iframes from, from firing, the code for the pixel tracker would detect that and then fall back on the classic pixel tracker. So in this case, it will be an iframe and the host site will need to, will need to actually display the iframe. And the iframe, all the iframe contains would be a script that runs on the context of the client browser, but being served by the, um, being served by the server that the iframe is coming from. And you'll see as well later on during the demo how everything works, which after this is the demo. So let me try that. All right. Uh, this is not clear. Okay. All right. Let me just make this one. Okay, this is uh, the page. You'll see, for example, let me see if I can do a split screen. Okay, this is the page. Let me know if it's too small. Yeah, you need to zoom in. Okay. All right, maybe I will need to do it like this then. And then I'll just do a. Oh, okay, it's doing a. Surface like thing. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. I will just run. Okay. So this is the page. You see the hello world there, right? And I will get on this page. Okay. Then you will see some some stuff in the in the information page box. So I I refresh the page. You will see that this. Uh, this is not seen because it's a one by one pixel, but you'll see on the on the server side that I was able to get the query parameter and I was able to get the cookie from it. And so that means that my server now gets all of the cookies from this particular uh, host, which is 4567. For example, I create a cookie, let's say, uh, how do I create it? Here, like another cookie. That's right. I save that and I refresh it. You'll see that the server is actually able to intercept that and get all the cookies from your uh, from your client without having to uh, like actually send anything. All it does is request the image. And that is actually quite powerful. Just by requesting a resource, you are able to receive or retrieve all of the cookie you know, for that particular browser. And that later on, I'll talk about the security implication of it. Why, uh, why we have all of these cores that are single, uh, single origin, uh, like definitions or those things, or like like security uh, issues. Another way of, of doing the pixel tracking would be the iframe. And you see it here. And I'm presenting it actually on the console log. So I'll show you again the iframe. All it does is log the low row, the query string, and also all the cookies. And you can see here that this is actually from the server side as well. It's not, uh, if you do, if you do a page source here, you'll see that. 
all the iframe does is actually logging in all the cookies itself, not uh, not through not being pulled from JavaScript. Again, the server has access to your cookies at this point and is able to log. Third thing that I put here that it's not part of the original presentation. Mm -hmm. Hello. We just lost you. Hello, Tristan. Are you there? Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Yeah, the internet is done. Disconnect. Network problem. Yeah, it looks like a network problem. Can we get someone to look at it? Did you guys start for Yeah, it'll be. Yeah. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Hello, Tristan. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, the internet just came back. Oh, okay. So, uh, which one? Where, where did I get cut off? Um, one more before this. I think we go to the tracking of the pixel. No, the cookies. The cookies part. The another cookie. We left off from there. Okay, really, that's quite so a uh, long time. Okay, so this is so we did we discuss the pixel and the cookie itself, and then that the the browser is actually able to retrieve it. Okay, the next one would be the iframe. To the iframe, I, I showed that, uh, what is it? that it is, I want this is a fresh browser here. Yeah, I showed that this is able to uh, retrieve the cookies as well from the server on the iframe. Because on the iframe, which is another HTTP request, just for every HTTP request that the browser does to the server, it sends along all of its cookies, and that's why this technique also works. Uh, again, it's not really a pixel, it's an iframe, but we are still using the same uh, pixel tracker and the filter here. And the last one was the fingerprint. Uh, the reason why there's two uh, browsers here now is because I wanted to show that even if I refresh this page, it's going to stay the same, but because this is the Canary browser, Google Canary, and this is the Chrome browser, the original Chrome, they have different fingerprints because they're different browsers, but even if I refresh them, it's the same device, even without using cookies, I can identify which device is actually going through. Okay, is everything caught up? Yep. Yep. All right. Now I'm I'm what I'm trying to do is so what I said I just said is that this is actually what the server uh, communication or whatever actually is going through. Is, is happening. So what happens is that Telnet is a, a great client, it's a text-only client, so you can Telnet into the uh, universal resource identifier, the URI, and the port, which is BT, uh, sorry, no, which is 4567 in our case, because the server lives in 4567, and what I can do is I can type get slash and get 
uh, protocol, which is HTTP slash 1.1, and then I type in the host, uh, local host, then press enter, and then see, this is what the server replies, HTTP 1.1, 200 OK, including that, and it just gives you to text box. But everything that I type is actually what's being sent by the browser. So what would happen most of the time would be the browser will send cookies, for example. I'm not sending the cookies in this case because uh, I don't want to type that. But this is the one of the very uh, like low level ways of accessing whatever is it, it is on your server. So uh, you, you've seen that cookies are being sent for every request and for and the server will be able to intercept it. And this is one of the reasons why we have these things. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with force or like cross-origin resource scripting. It's really, really horrible, especially if you've been working with JavaScript uh, purely on the client side, because you'd like to request a resource, for example, outside of your current domain, and then unless that particular resource had a force header on it and allows external access, you're not going to be able to access it through the client. And so you'll have to write like side proxy of retrieving that same resource so that it's going to be originating from your same domain and then that your client side script can then uh, can then retrieve that particular data. Now why why is this so difficult? Again it's because for every for every browser request your cookie uh, uh, the browser cookies are being sent. And so what happens is that uh, for example you you have a bank, for example, like a bank site, and then let's say Google suddenly started becoming Google, and then all of your GTM trackers, we started looking at the cookies that, uh, that are being sent by your browser. And so without the same origin policy, then Google would be able to read the cookies, the session cookies of your bank, and then would be able to log in as you for your bank, for example, right? And because they would be living in two different domains, like Google would be on the Google.com domain and your bank domain, or your own server would be on your own server domain, the cookies don't cross with each other, and if you're using cookies to store sessions, then it's not going to be, like, it's not going to, to overflow into other servers. And that's also one of the reasons why course is quite important. Uh, it's, it's like a side effect of this particular security. There are other ways to track. Uh, we've talked about the browser fingerprinting. There are also ways of doing device fingerprinting, for example, where you would, like, for example, in your mobile phone, like, you can gather some information, like, let's say, all of the access points, like Wi-Fi access points that you have around you, uh, the, the Wi-Fi uh, hardware address that is being available to you. So if you have a lower level access to the hardware, then you're able to do that. Uh, most, most applicable to Android or iPhone applications. There's also this thing called the EverCookie. Uh, this was a big hit in the 2010s. Uh, this came out first. Basically what happens is you have all of these. So we have three, for example, on the on the index that I showed you, right? But EverCookie, what happens is that they have a lot more ways of tracking. And every time a particular tracker is deleted, let's say for example a cookie was deleted, the tracking cookie was deleted because you want to delete all your cookies, all of your cookies the other tracking uh, ways will start filling in that information again. So you have to delete, in order to delete an effort cookie, you have to delete them all at the same time. Because if you delete just one of them, all the other trackers will come back and rewrite the same information into that, uh, into that tracker. So it was, it's very, very difficult to remove tracking at that point. And there was all this blue aha about it, and it's not as useful now, but for historical purposes, you should try and look at it as well. Now, all of this is very, very complicated, and it's not necessarily something that people would immediately get. But I think it's, uh, so this, this is the time when I feel that when, when my team actually mentioned that they had no idea how pixel trackers work and how and how HTTP actually worked, I figured that we are doing such 
crazy, complicated front-end JavaScript and interactions and complicated servers serving all of these content when we're actually just scraping the surface of it and we're not diving deep into the basics of our craft. And I believe that in order to start mastering uh, or have mastery of our craft, we need to start going back to the basics, like what exactly are the building blocks of this technology that we're, we're making a living on. If we're a JavaScript developer, how exactly is the JavaScript being executed by the browser? What's, uh, why, why is there a difference with ES5 and ES6? Why are browsers so slow to, um, to move from ES5 to ES6? What are the historical implications of this? aside from the technology as well. So I think it's time for us to step up our game and start looking into the fundamentals of the technology that we're working at. So again, I'm Paris Good. Thank you for listening. And uh, you can find me at Twitter, uh, our, uh, on Facebook, or wherever else. If you search Paris Good on the internet, you can find me. If you want some resources, I will be posting this I don't know where to post it, Louis, so I don't have to read on the I think we can use back the KL Ruby VPN. I'm using, we are using okay. that. Okay, then then that's good. So I'll, I'll, I'll bump my post, and you'll find here the Git repository of the Pixel demo, some information about iframes and cookies from Mozilla. So they maintain a very, very good documentation of the technology behind browsers. Um, another click for checking about your fingerprint. And of course, the Ever Cookie is still alive for its work of purposes. So I don't see any questions in the application. I don't know if it's working or nobody just answered or asked questions. But if you have any questions, then sure, I'm uh, I'm okay. I think probably um, first thing is that tracking. So yeah. for the tracking that you show, does it shows the mouse movement, the heat maps? You're able to generate those? Oh, because I'm not, uh, so I can. So what happens is I need to set an event listener to actually listen to those events and send them. But what's going to happen is instead, so this is how I would do it, instead of sending it immediately as soon as the event happens, which will go into have latency, right? Because for every movement, it's going to stand, it's going to be, uh, it needs to wait for the server to come back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save it locally into like some some structure in memory, for example, and then maybe in an internal every 30 seconds to just send the whole history into the server as a chunk. Mm -hmm. Any question from here about tracking user behavior? I think. No one. Well, it's not really tracking user behaviors. It's more about the, the low level fundamentals of how actual tracking works. It's not just about tracking in the browser. It's uh -huh. like about like it's, it's taking advantage of the fact that cookies are sent for every browser request. Mm -hmm. You can actually do something in the middle while uh, while the browser. So when the browser, you can even masquerade that. You can probably you can see that I was serving a slash pixel dot file. Yep. But it's not a file. It's, it's some code plus outputting a file in the end. So from the client, it is a file. But because you're running something in the middle, that's actually where the tracking happens. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. Any questions at all? No. Okay. Usually, all this tracking is written in the backend language, or is it like JavaScript? So the question is, yeah. Do you heard yeah. the question? Yes, I, I did hear the okay. question. But anyway, for, for the for the video as well, like uh, can are, are all the tracking only done is the tracking only done on the server side that uh, server side or also on the client side, right? And I've shown actually two of them. The classic pixel tracker happens on the server side because you actually intercept the request before you actually uh, send the file. So instead when the browser requests pixel.png, instead of immediately giving you the pixel, we uh, we send we, we pr first create like some maybe maybe instead of just doing a, what's there a, a Ruby logger we can maybe 
record something on the database first and then send the file. That's, ha that's happening on the server side, but at the same time, you can have something on the client side as well, which is the iframe. The iframe actually, you can see that it was a console.log. So you can do a console log there. So instead of maybe a console log, you can start saving stuff into a window variable or maybe into local storage into, or into a cookie. And then maybe later on, like after a minute or so, or every minute, you have uh, something like a, a thread that wakes up and then sends the whole uh, tracker information into the server so that you can be persistent. Or you don't even have to do that. You can just persist it on local storage and then uh, do something about it. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Cool. cool. So if no question, then we move to the next talk. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tristan. So, uh, Jimmy, are you there? Or yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Do you want to? Start with yours, talk or I start mine. It's okay. Over. Uh, can I do mine first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I guess I because I have to hop off. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, this is my first time presenting over the line. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, everything works out. Uh, and yeah. <clears throat> can you see my screen? Yep. I mean, good. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, hang on. <laughs> how many? Well, I guess I need to go back. Wait. I was gonna ask. How many of you are Ruby developers, and how many of you are JavaScript developers in the house? <laughs> so happy. Ruby developers. We have three. Uh, we JavaScript have three. developers. One. One JavaScript developer. Oh. So we, we so the Penang community is out like uh, <laughs> Ruby Ruby has uh, More. taken over <laughs> for now <laughs> for now it's already finished and the rest of you I see other people as well I guess uh, other developers Go developers PHP developers oh they just join in to see what's going on all right cool cool yeah. cool nice to see you guys. Uh, I would definitely want to join you guys one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so without further ado, I guess uh, this talk is about uh, Hyperloop. Uh, and I presented this talk uh, last week in the KL Ruby Brigade. Uh, sorry, KL Ruby Meetup. So sorry if you have already heard this. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if not, then yes. <laughs> uh, so basically, uh, this is a perfect uh, meetup to present this since Hyperloop is actually a framework for writing React app in Ruby. So if you have not heard about this before and you are in this uh, Ruby meetup, uh, Ruby plus JS meetup, then yeah, I, I guess this is perfect for you. Um, so. Um, so I'm Jimmy. Uh, I'm an engineering team lead at Rapid River, uh, and I usually host the KL Ruby Brigade uh, meetup. Uh, and I I used to organize RubyCon, not anymore. Uh, and yes, uh, we definitely are always looking for more people to join the Ruby community. So yes, please, if you guys are interested in you know, building the community, which is all about, which is all uh, what open source is all about. You know, top degree after this, <laughs> and uh, grow the community in Penang. Uh, so, what is Hyperloop? Uh, have you guys heard of Hyperloop? Uh, sorry, React RV before? Any of you heard of React yes. RV before? I, I guess I need to move back and forth my screen to see. <laughs> I can't see you anyways. <laughs> anyways, uh, it's really React RV. Uh, before this, they uh, changed to Hyperloop, and it's a full stack web tooling for single page applications. So uh, it's just a fancy way to say that it, it's, uh, it has like a built-in framework, like scaffolding to, to build like single page apps. Uh, in this case, it's, it's a, a React a single page app. So, uh, it is uh, coined as the complete isomorphic Ruby framework. So basically, isomorphic means you can use 
the same code both server side and client side. So uh, yeah, you can basically do that with Hyperloop. Uh, and it will soon be renamed to Hyperstack. So, and uh, one of the reasons I guess is to not confuse themselves with this guy, because uh, if you Google Hyperloop, this is all it shows up. <laughs> it does not show up the Ruby Hyperloop. Uh, so probably that's the reason why they are uh, changing this. Uh, over, maybe, and I guess it's as good as yours. Um, so let's get into the uh, compositions uh, or the building blocks of uh, the Hyperloop framework. Uh, so in Hyperloop, you have five different compo uh, objects. Uh, so the component objects will be similar to a, like a React component object, which I'll show you later. So basically, this is where you define all the 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 um, the HTML DOMs, the 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 event uh, uh, what do you call this the event handlers and everything. Of course, uh, if you are familiar with React, this is this is really uh, almost uh, the same way you would write a React component. Um, then the next will be what is called operations. So operations is what uh, uh, is an object that uh, encapsulates business logic. So basically, you can think about them as uh, like a like a controller or maybe some uh, feature uh, feature uh, uh, classes uh, or something like that. So it, it just helps to uh, basically define the operations of uh, of, of your app. Uh, uh, of course, it has more than just uh, BSL for you to write stuff. The BSL actually helps to do a lot of things, like for example, handling uh, uh, the promises that the previous uh, step uh, gives, and and basically it it it's, it it allows you to handle like the failures and success uh, 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 conditions quite easily. Uh, the next thing would be the models. So uh, you will have Actually, use uh, we will be using active record models uh, in this case. So, Hyperloop models is actually ha active record models that this has just been moved to the Hyperloop uh, folder. So, in the demo later, you will see that uh, uh, we don't really need to do anything other than just create the model and move it over to the Hyperloop folder to activate this. Uh, you can think of it as exposing this to your front end app uh, in a way. Uh, and this is truly isomorphic. You don't really need to do anything extra just to write that. Uh, you, you, you're just using the spinning uh, file. Policies is something that is built into Hyperloop. So you can think of it as like an uh, authorization uh, framework. Uh, so it has, a, it has a DSL you can use to define the uh, operation parameters of all your models. So imagine that you can define things like can a user with admin level edit certain objects or can uh, otherwise they can only read or they can only uh, 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 list out uh, in an index. So kind of like Pandit. Um, so this is what the policies give you out of the box. Stores are basically like uh, React store. Uh, so you can think of it as like a Redux store. Um, and it is uh, basically a flux store uh, under the hood. So everything you can do with the flux store, it's based, it, you, you can do it with, uh, with uh, the Hyperloop store. And again, yeah, it's super easy to set up. It is super easy to define. Uh, and yeah, which I'll show you later. So this is like a diagram of what each component does and where it sits on the client and the server side. So the client side, you will see that the components and the store will reside solely on the client side. The components and the store will basically be transformed into JavaScript. That, that's basically it, um, and and it will come, it will turn itself into a React component, and it will live in the client side. Uh, operations and models. As you can see, it spans between client and model. So these two things are isomorphic in a way that you can define this uh, in Ruby and you can use the same operation in Ruby and in, uh, in, in, in React. 
and the policies themselves uh, deals with the the authorization layer uh, of the model. So it sits on the server side and it gets handled on the server request. And everything sits on top of Rails in this case. Uh, this is a diagram for Hyperloop Rails. If you decide to use uh, Hyperloop on top of Rails, you can use Hyperloop on top of uh, anything, uh, other, I mean, uh, other frameworks other than Rails. Uh, you just need to do some extra scaffolding um, but nothing will stop you from, nothing can stop you from using Hyperloop with, say, uh, I don't know, like, uh, Sinatra. Sorry? Sinatra. Trail. Yeah, Sinatra or anything like that. So, so right now I'm showing you uh, the demo, later on, it will be uh, a demo on uh, Hyperloop Rails. Um, any questions so far? No. Nope? Okay, cool. Uh, uh, C -sharp. Sorry? Can it work with C sharp? Can it work with C sharp? Um, oh, I C don't think that it works with C, C sharp. The, the, the whole gem is written in Ruby. Uh -huh. So I'm not sure how you plan to use this with C sharp. Okay. 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 Maybe I'll maybe later it will be more clear how it works. <laughs> So let, let me show you some code examples of uh, each of those, uh, these objects. So if you look at Hyperloop component, at the top here you see the example of uh, a uh, React component. Oh wait, how come my mouse cannot show up at all? Mm, no way. So at the top here you see the React component written in JavaScript. Uh, and you can see that this uh, very basic simple example of uh, UL with a whole bunch of uh, allies, uh, which list out all the books and the book's name. At the bottom here, you can see the equivalent in written in uh, Hyperloop component. Uh, Hyperloop component class is just any class that you can just have a render function that you extend uh, the, and that you uh, inherit from the Hyperloop component class. And you can see that uh, there's a built-in DSL function called render. And you can pass in the root element inside the render. In our case here is the new L. Um, and you can use plain Ruby code here. You can see here book.all.h is basically the Ruby uh, function to query all the books uh, from the database. And do each, uh, uh, and there's a block here which just defines the loop and underneath the loop, uh, inside the loop you will see the li and uh, it will have a click function for it uh, that if you click on add book name then uh, it will call a function called add, add book to basket so basically this is like a shopping you know, cart basket type uh, uh, thingy for books um, so yeah then basically uh, you can have if else just like how you do it in uh, Ruby anyways, uh, like acting user basket include book. Uh, if it, the basket includes the book already, then you don't show this li at all. So this is basically uh, uh, how you define a uh, uh, React component in uh, Ruby Hyperloop. Operations is also uh, very simple. You can just define any class and you inherit from Hyperloop operations and it gives you uh, a few DSLs to work with. The params DSL will basically define what parameters you can pass into this operation. So in this case, we can we will we, we will be able to pass in a book uh, type param called book. Uh, so basically when you call upon this function, you will run steps. Uh, defined at the bottom. Here you can you will, uh, we, we see one step uh, defined, but you can define multiple steps after this as well. And you can see that the steps uh, uh, is just plain Ruby. Uh, you can call anything here. In this case, we are calling uh, uh, return if acting user uh, watch list include uh, uh, the uh, uh, book. So what is this? This is add to acting users watch list. So what this function does is that it adds a book into a user's watch list list. Um, so obviously if the book is already in the list, you don't want to do anything. So hence you do return if 
acting user, which is the active user right now. Uh, the watch list includes the book. And then uh, watch list mailer dot new book email. So uh, this is basically just uh, 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 calling the function new book email uh, that uh, you passes another param which is watchlist.create um, uh, this is just for the benefit of I mean I, this is for the benefit of, uh, of I guess uh, uh, you guys who haven't seen Ruby code before uh, that uh, basically uh, let me see if I can find my cursor <laughs> maybe this is better uh, uh, this Hey guys, see? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this function, it, uh, you can see that this is a slash. So basically, it, uh, it indicates that this is for this is this is actually the same line. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Act, this watch list dot create creates a watch list in the database that accepts the user and a book parameter. So basically, this function will return you a watch list object, which then is passed as a parameter into the new book email uh, function. So the watch list mailer is probably a mailer that uh, emails you the you know emails the user the the book. Uh, that they have just added into their watch list, and the email uh, watch list mailer function new book email accepts the watch list as a parameter. Yeah, just for the benefit of those that don't know uh, Ruby. So this is just an operation that uh, you can define step by step. So you can define next step, which will only occur or run if the first step is done. So if there's any error happened here, it will run the second step. So using this, you can easily set up like uh, failure cases and uh, failure conditions that uh, you know you know you will not run anything if say if there's any error, you don't send email, or if there's error, you want to send some alert email or something like that. So so this is how you can define the steps. Um, uh, next would be the model. I put the model. Uh, it's just in this case in Ruby, uh, sorry, in Hyperloop Rails, it's just uh, uh, you can use the application record. Uh, just change it to Hyperloop. Uh, wait, uh, sorry, uh, you can just use the application record and put it inside uh, the Hyperloop folder, which I'll show you later. So just uh, vanilla Rails model. And straight away, you can already use this inside the component. Uh, we see earlier that this is already used in the earlier example where book dot each dot something. In this case, we are using book dot in catalog, which is a scope defined uh, in the application record. And this scope is just saying that the book where the catalog is true. So in this is pure Ruby uh, active record. So it's less uh, that. Uh, you can just use uh, in any way you want inside the component. Uh, so yeah, you that that you you already have like a, a, a two way binding uh, for the database record and also the display display. Uh, policy. Uh, if you are familiar with Pandit, so policy is kind of how you define different operation parameters on models. So in this case, we can define the policy for books. And the policy is that uh, you can only allow change, uh, on, uh, sorry, allow create and update if, let's say, the user is an admin. So this is how you define the policy. And uh, operation policy as well, uh, you can say that uh, you can uh, only invoke this on the server uh, uh, if this is an acting user, or uh, if, 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 if let's say uh, there's 
when in as a long term user you can invoke this. Uh, no, basically, there's an act, if there's an acting user only, then you execute this on the server. So basically, that's the that's the parameters of uh, executing any operation. So you can define policy for both the models and the operation. Uh, last but not not least, this is just a store, uh, and uh, this is the way you can share states between uh, components. So components, you can define states on your uh, in, within the component itself. But say, for example, if you have to share it across different components, most likely you're going to use the global store, uh, shared store, sorry. Um, and this is uh, this is how you do it in Hyperloop. You can just define a class and with inherit the Hyperloop store. And you can just define the state of the store. Uh, so in this case, this store, have a store discount and it's scoped to the class and it uh, has an automatically defined reader. So uh, once you do this, you can straight away do discount dot uh, discounter dot discount and it will give you 30. And you can also mutate it uh, uh, by calling dot mutate discount and it will discount uh, and it will uh, update the discount state value. And also, you can define functions like a model that you can just uh, create some helper functions. Say, for example, uh, lucky dip means that the discount will uh, you, you will change your discount like uh, between you know, uh, plus five or minus five. So once you call this function, you will you take this discount uh, plus uh, within this range uh, randomly. So you can define functions like this. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's look at the demo. What I have here is uh, it's an app that I have. It's a Rails app that I have basically run a few things. Uh, let me show you what it is. Huh. What is this? I have never seen this before. <laughs> what is that? Huh? What's that? No, no, you can just do a, a get log, you know. Yeah, but I want to see this. Uh, uh, that's like, uh, like you're on GitHub, you can also see the commit. History there. Ooh, yeah, let's, let's see this. If you are interested as well, you can go to my GitHub, Jimmy, uh, and you are Um, and the repo is called Hyperloop Rails to Do MVC. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go through the comments just to save us some time. So uh, I have just started uh, with a clean Rails app. I did Rails. So you can see that the gen file here doesn't uh, have the hyperloop yet. Okay. <laughs> so I just have a vanilla Rails uh, app spin up from scratch. The next thing I did was I installed the Hyperloop gem. You just put it in the gem file. You run bundle install, and after that I run Rails g install Hyperloop. This is the command to initialize a few things in uh, the Rails app. Uh, it adds a few lines of uh, uh, stuff in application JS. It adds this uh, default uh, Hyperloop mount in the routes. Uh, and that's it, I think. Um, then there's 
a few things. Sorry, uh, there's a new few files generated as well. Uh, there's a file called policies, application policies, uh, which defines the Hyperloop public space. This is app policies. Uh, and the last thing is the initializer uh, a file for Hyperloop that uh, looks like this. So Rails G install Hyperloop will give you all this. Uh, then you do, uh, then what I did after this is I install Hot Reload. Uh, so there's a gem called Opal Hot Reload, uh, Hot Reloader. So that uh, sets up Hot Reload for development purposes uh, so that you don't need to hit refresh every time uh, we uh, change the component. And uh, I added Foreman as well to just make things easier to spin up because I need to spin up the hot reloader and also the web together. So whenever I do development, this is what I do. I spin up the hot reloader. Uh, it, it, I have to define which folder to watch. So in this case, I'm watching the app iPhone folder. And I'm just spinning up Rails. Uh, there's a few things you need to do to enable hot reloader. So that's, that's here. Uh, you need to define the port that is listening. Uh, by default, running bundle except for hot reloader will run the hot reloader uh, in port 25222. And yeah, and the last thing is that I will basically add this into the Hyperloop configuration so that it gets bundled together uh, in the uh, in the compiled uh, JavaScript. So uh, at this point, I have basically the hello world uh, working. Right, I remember. <laughs> uh, so, so if I do uh, format. <coughs> So here like, you can see that I'm starting web, uh, I'm starting hot reloader. Um, and here, um, let's see my launch. Ah, this is this is <laughs> old cache. Uh, oh, I have not defined anything yet. Sorry, so I have not defined any components yet. Yeah, I have not defined any components yet. But it's quite easy to define components. So, uh, so you can do Rails G hyper loop. Uh, maybe we can just probably have hello world for now. And uh, wait, oh, sorry, I saw a component. <coughs> That's it. All it does is that it creates a, fold, uh, a new file in the component folder, have hello world. Uh, with a whole bunch of uh, default like uh, default stuff, and you you might be familiar with this. This is basically React lifecycle stuff. So you have before, after mount, before and after. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, before and mount and before update, uh, which we don't need right now. And uh, we can just uh, do. In our, uh, maybe we can just do root, uh, do hyper loop, hello, and should give me. It takes some time for the first boot 
because it's compiling everything. And you can see that this is how easy it is to create a React component. This is definitely a React component, as you can see here. Uh, so yeah, uh, it gives you a whole bunch of uh, scaffolding tools like that. Uh, now, uh, the next thing I did is uh, stop the to do list. Uh, any of you heard of to do MVC? No? To do MVC? Okay, now I can see your faces. <laughs> So to do MVC, uh, if you go to to do MVC.com, it's a project uh, created to benchmark in a way the development experience of different uh, frameworks, uh, different JavaScript frameworks in this case. So the idea is that you have to build a to-do list with a certain set of features uh, using different uh, different frameworks, and you can compare how's the uh, development experience. And it has already a few examples done in many different frameworks. You can find Vue, you can find uh, like React, Backbone, Angular, and for every uh, every major framework, you can see an example of this to do MVC. So yeah, uh, and then yeah, so, so this is this is a a way to benchmark uh, development uh, experiences in a way. So what I did is, this is uh, what it looks like to do MVC. Uh, where is to do MVC? <coughs> Maybe I can just spin it up. Um, so this one. All right. So. Sorry. <clears throat> Agree. What's the time limit for the talk? <laughs> I think you can take like five more minutes or ten minutes oh, max. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll go fast then. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay, I'll show you this and I'll show you the rest quickly. So this is a to-do list template. This is pure HTML and you can see that the to-do MVC already handles a bunch of uh, CSS and all these things. Uh, so all you need to do is implement uh, a design uh, and the logic that goes with it. Um, so uh, I will try, uh, my goal is to try to turn this, this, uh, which is nothing, <laughs> into this, okay? So let's just move ahead to my solution. Yeah, and probably this is the fastest way we can see just let me rebuild it. Now the thing is, uh, I'm doing a whole bunch of file changes by checking out. Uh, so usually you don't need to do restart every time. Uh, but I ran into a couple of problems where it doesn't bundle or reload properly. So uh, just for safety, <laughs> I did this. But usually when you do development, you don't really need uh, to do um, uh, we uh, we start. So this is the completed app. Uh, you can see that there's all two, uh, the crud features here. So uh, so this is all powered by the database. Uh, this is all uh, connected, uh, and you can see uh, that if I do something new, I can see here it it will update. So basically. Uh, it underneath it's using action cable to monitor changes and push it to the client. So you can see that everything uh, will be uh, pushed uh, as long as there's an open uh, connection. 
Um, then you can see things like uh, uh, this is the click action uh, with uh, React route. So if this is not a page reload. This is a React route. Um, uh, what else? Uh, this is delete. This is edit. And yeah, we covered all the CRUD operations and the filtering uh, and with like uh, so like and this is it. So this is the completed app. Let me show you the code. Uh, from the routes, you can see that uh, I have, well, this is no longer needed, actually. Um, and I'm typing everything into this uh, component. So this is just a wildcard to capture everything, uh, to just uh, show the component. Um, this is just so that I can, you know, uh, achieve this. So if let's say I come back here, it will it will still work because uh, although I'm using hot, uh, I'm using React routes here. Uh, obviously, uh, like uh, obviously active only have this, and if I don't handle this, this will this will be all for right. So that's why I have this. And everything just packs to the to-do list. Now let's go to the to-do list. And this looks a bit uh, better in a way that it, uh, it's more e easily uh, readable kind of structure. You can see there's a header, there's a footer, and in the middle there's a bunch of routes. So this is, if you are familiar with React routes, this is how you define routes. Uh, you tell it what routes uh, uh, and what component it needs to render. So in this case, the root route uh, just renders the list, and any other route with something uh, will also render the list, but the parameter will be saved as scope. Um, so let's look at list. List is like this. Uh, so we have a section name, but by the way, this is all default. This is all uh, like. Uh, copied and migrated over from the HTML that I downloaded earlier from to do MVC. So you can see that there's an input at the top and there's a URL which lists out all my uh, to do items. In this case, uh, each of the to do items will render this. This is also a component here. Uh, of course, there's not, no, nothing to stop you from this. You know, uh, this always uh, uh, you can always do everything here. But yeah, this is how I did it, and I've done it here. So you can see that there's a couple of actions that has been added to the checkbox. So if you click on the checkbox, it will mark the item as either completed or not completed. If you double click it, it will show the editing uh, editing text box. If you click on the destroy, it will call the items dot destroy. By the way, this is just the same way you can call uh, active record model items. And yeah, the rest are just uh, yeah. There's another edit item uh, um, uh, component here that I just defined together with this. Uh, you can obviously put this in a different class. Uh, the header again is just uh, input field with on. Uh, on key press, if I press enter, it will run this create new to do operation. So what is this operation? Uh, you can go to components, hyper, uh, sorry, hyper operations, create new to do op. Step one, create to do. Uh, basically, this is just calling the database change. And the second thing is to change the title to empty. So whenever I change something here, I want it to clear out. And I'm using this to do store to do it. So since I need to control the component by something else, uh, I'm doing this through the store because the component is just reading the store value. You can see here the component reads the to do store title value, and as long as, uh, as 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 long as I mutate this anywhere in the app, uh, it will be updated. Sorry, not this one. It will be updated there on the component. That's how I care. Uh, there are other operations like uh, clear completed. So in this case, you can also just simply call uh, post uh, to any you know 
uh, 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 part here. In this case, if you look at the post part here, it calls clear completed. I have a special controller here that's handle that handles server ops uh, to call clear complete. So what is clear complete? So first of all, what is to do? So to do is just uh, active record model. The only difference is that the hyperloop model you put it in app hyperloop model. The normal Rails model you put it in app model, right? So that's the only difference. And both Rails and the Hyperloop can share the code. Now you can see here I've defined a class a method called clear completed, which calls completed destroy all. Unfortunately, you can't do uh, destroy all uh, using the client uh, because with the data binding, uh, each of these is bound to like a like a, like an action for one of these items. So um, it doesn't trigger the clear all if let's say you call it this way and it doesn't allow you to call uh, the crud uh, on more than one object like a collection. So that's just a caveat uh, for you if you need to do something like this. You have to do it on the server side. Uh, but it's easy. You, 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 just, you just need to issue like a post request. And you can see that this is easily handled if there's a failure. Uh, you can just put a fail step in and you can just alert it out. This is just a, a JavaScript alert. Uh, to, uh, the last thing I will just talk about is the edit. So edit here you have norm, uh, step one just to call the edit uh, update function. The next step is to use, you take the editing state of the component to false. Um, so again Step two will not run unless step one is completed, so you can ensure that nothing goes wrong here. Uh, even though uh, this step is uh, failed, uh, it will still uh, behave the same way as you uh, intended it to. So yeah, that's that's about it. I think uh, I don't have any uh, hyperloop uh, policies written for uh, this app, but yeah, I guess uh, you can also just play around. So last thing uh, I wanted to talk about is just as a summary. Uh, I, I I guess uh, if you are very interested in uh, in this, then great, go ahead uh, because it's super easy to pick up. Uh, there's tons of tutorial in the website. There's tons of documentations on the website. Uh, there's a lot of sample apps you can download and take a look at. So definitely very easy to learn. Uh, and everything we just saw is all Ruby, so we can write in one language only, front end and back end, obviously. Uh, that's that's a, I, I think that's a that's a that's a plus here. Uh, the operations and model are isomorphic, like I mentioned, so that you only need to write once, uh, and it will handle both server and client side. Uh, and it has out of the box uh, authentication uh, and server side rendering. And it has a very active contributors group of contributors that is currently still working on it. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I think you, you, uh, is good about Hyperloop. Uh, why not to use Hyperloop? Uh, I I think it's still a, in a very early stage. Uh, not as in like the age of this gem. This gem has been there for this project has been there for almost like six seven years already. But the adoption is quite low, uh, probably because maybe people uh, uh, like to work directly with JavaScript React uh, and not uh, go through another transpiling layer. Uh, but yeah, it's it's fairly new in adoption and it's very low in adoption. So if you run into any problems, uh, you cannot find the solution in Stack also. So you, you have to kind of follow within the parameters uh, like what the readme and uh, the documentation provides. So if you want to go a bit more adventurous, you, you kind of need to start looking at the code. And obviously there's framework locking, you cannot use the same code hyperloop uh, to, to port it over anywhere else. You, there's no easy porting uh, if you decide to uh, leave hyperloop, so you have to write everything again. Um, also the fact, also similar reason for the point number one is that if you, 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 if you want to fully utilize the power of React, you will need to learn React. And therefore, to fully utilize the power of Hyperloop, 
or hyperset, you will need to learn React anyways. And therefore, I think that's the reason why people just prefer to write React. Uh, but you can see the benefit as well in writing in Hyperloop because you can see the code structure. Everything is so clean and everything is using Ruby. Uh, it, 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 you can use uh, blocks, you can use all the good stuff that Ruby uh, provides you. Uh, and obviously, there's another extra layer of transforming from Ruby to JS. So uh, when you're doing development, obviously, uh, everything happens in real time. It's a bit slower that way. Uh, and But in production, obviously, you're just compiling it when you deploy the project. That, that's not, that's not, a, not a big deal there. And uh, I feel like there's still some bugs left in the system. Uh, like I, I, I'm, I'm sure they are still actively fixing it. But yeah, uh, because of the low adoption, because of the low, uh, not a lot of people for support for the community, so bugs tend to get like longer to get fixed. Uh, of course, uh, if you decide to, you know, uh, help out with the project, that's, uh, Definitely something, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would recommend. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, if you are interested to see more and learn more, just go to ruby-hyperloop.org and hyperstack.org. Uh, those are the only two resources you can find out there. There's nothing else out there. Uh, so find those two and you then all the resources are there uh, for you to get up to speed. And that's it. Thanks. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Oh, have a look. Any questions? No. Yeah. I have a question. Yep. What are uh, what are the typical use cases where you would use this framework? Like, what kind of websites? Obviously, to do it, but what else? Um, the I think the best use case for 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 React or Hyperloop or any of those uh, JavaScript framework is single page applications. So not a normal like admin page style application, but maybe a very highly interactive uh, app that requires like a lot of real time. Uh, you want to minimize load uh, page load uh, uh, and therefore you want to use single page uh, and yeah, typically the it's not typical use case for like per se for Hyperloop, but it's like for React applications in this case. So uh, single page app is perfect for uh, React is perfect for building single page applications. Obviously, you can also build small components that you can just plug in plug into your web uh, existing website. So imagine you can just write the uh, the to do list. As a as a as a component, you can bundle it and you can insert it into a website anywhere, existing website. You don't need to write a single page app to do that. But, but again, that that's like a React feature, but but uh, not not like a Hyperloop feature. Cool. Thank you. So okay, um, thank you, Jimmy. So from the floor, so um, we still have time. There's two types of option right now. One is that we carry on with uh, some of the interviews and it's more on a Q&A um, style of um, continuing this session or we move on to another topic which I have in um, previous RubyConf. I, uh, I present a BDD with uh, Cucumber. So it depends whether you want to go forward with a talk or more towards a Q&A session where all the developers is there and you can ask any questions. It's more on the interactive whatever questions and if you don't have a question then we have a panel um, there to guide us through some questions. Do you prefer that interactive or another talk? Yep. Or go by votes. So who agree with uh, another talk? I'm interested in testing. Uh, okay. Like how, how do testing, or do do? testing? Yeah. So two on testing. Anyone? Mm. Oh, I've seen. <laughs> no. Testing. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so so um so we move on to the topic. So next one. So this um let me. Okay, I'm gonna drop off. Bye guys. Have fun. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye. How to present uh, this one? You right? have to share your screen. Yeah, screen share. Yeah. Share. Okay.
So let me go to the back. Is it working? Is it working? Okay. Do you see this? Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, today my topic will be on BDD with cucumber. So um, I'm Gui. Um, I'm an ex software engineer from Monet. So that's where I pick up cucumber. Um, I'm currently working in a different company right now. I'm working in a Functionize and Piconex. Um, I still work with Python, Java. Uh, not Loa anymore, it's Nginx and Ruby um, during my free time. So, yeah. KL. So, this is the previous one. Never mind. So, what is BDD? And uh, introduction to Cucumber, and then we we'll go through like uh, on app how on app use Cucumber. So, what is BDD? So, BDD came from two um, another methodology, TDD and ATDD. Uh, test driven development and uh, that already got ATDD. You see acceptance test driven development. So, so this is the methodology for acceptance test driven um, development. You have customer development testing where it's um, your test is mostly focused on um, ex acceptance test, right? So um, more on the business use case, um, class requirement, um, test driven development. So this is the process. Okay. So first you write a unit test, then you run the unit test. You make sure uh, the unit test fail at first. If it pass, means that's not the test. It doesn't work, right? Make it make sure it uh, fail, and then you write the code to make it pass. Make the code pass. And then it refactor to make things cleaner because your code might be just make sure it passes. You don't care the style or whatever, so you make you refactor and make it um, pretty, and you repeat the process again. So this is test driven development. So BDD ta tactics. So you ha should have a user story, um, the behavior that contributes the most, um, and um, describe those in a single notation. So um, User story normally you have for the program managers, for the uh, feature designers, you have user um like how the user will use your features, right? Um so you write down in plain text when the user goes through this page, what it clicks, what should it sees, the flow of your feature, and then the behavior that contribute the most. So you only want want the things that important you don't want implement things that fancy stuff you want to see things that flying around no things that really matters so you focus on those to write the test for those right and then describe in single notation because um people want to get things uh simplified so if you go through a full paragraph not full paragraph a full article describing what you want to do in the test it doesn't make sense because you are throwing too many things to uh, the developers for the testers so describe it in simple straightforward things that what you want right and applying to the lowest level of abstraction behavior driven development so um, as the uh, how to say BDD terms uh, business focus on business requirements stories user actions rather than what is your technology stuff like um, is it inside a loop or is it related to which payment to use you don't care you just want things that works with the business goal right make things work um, help to architecture the features and uh, the, for documentation wise because if you have your test, test cases that's also your documentation how should your system work in that particular feature so if you go back and ask your developer, uh, when I click this, what should happen? Huh? No one knows because there might be a lot of code jumping all around places to know what is happening. If you have a test, you know exactly what should happen. And then you easily tell your support or your customer easily because it's in your test. It should behave in a certain way, right? Um, so BDD started by um, this guy. Um, 
at first it's called specification by example. So process this process primarily consists of two activities. Um, first is a specification workshop, the three amigos. A product manager, the developers, and the testers. So these three people are those who will draft the specification. So the project manager will be the one that brings in business um, spe specification, the business um, goals that you need to achieve in terms of customer, how the customer should feel when they use this product, what is the feature the customer wants. The developers will think of how, what is the strategy to draft um, the features and um, also the technologies that suitable for this. The tester will, in the other hand, will give some ideas and also um, inputs on how to test the stuff or whether this is a viable um, things to actually work. So like, um, how to say, so if you want to test things that um, very high skill, so not very high skill. Is it like user experience? Yeah, like user experience more towards uh, product manager. Tester will be more on the technical part where how to test the certain things to make sure everything is in place. But Tester will give um, inputs on the specification workshop. And then next activities is example mapping. So this is the activities when you do this um, example mapping. First you create a story, then you create a rule, an example. So how, how do you make sure this um, sticky notes, right? So um, you basically write down things that you um, think that's important for the business and then you stick in categories which one goes to where right and then questions um, on the right hand side so for this you can visit the link pickles pro example mapping you can google for that there will be more description on that right example mapping um scenario versus acceptance criteria so um the scenario is an example of the system behavior from one or more user perspective Certain criteria are sets of rules. So one is example, one is the rules that cover the aspect of a system behavior. Okay. Um, next, we'll in terms of um, deciding which feature to go, you have a Roman voting. So it's kind of a style where people vote for certain features, yes or no, right? So to abstain, you just put either way. If you don't agree, then down, then um, you need to further, how to say, you need to get a majority vote from this. If you find people um, disagree with it, you need to convince him or else you will repeat the cycle and you will get a majority vote, vote for the um, specification to move forward. Because you don't want to build things that a lot of people doesn't like it. So you need to get majority buy-in, right? That's why you have a specification workshop, right? Question. Yep. Buy-in from whom? Buy-in from the um, project manager, the developers, and the testers. Okay, got it. Yep. So, um, so outside in development, so um, for doing a uh, specification, that's this is one of the way. Outside in means you go for um, the flow. This typically for programmers, so you let the user to explain it in terms of um, the behavior, the flow of the feature, and then programmers will look at it and how to design it to work exactly to fit the flow, right? So you put timers for one hour, twenty minutes, and do this. So now we move on to Cucumber. So this is the part that uh, I'm more um, experienced with. I've worked in um, for Cucumber on on Cucumber particular for three years. So what is Cucumber? So it's for uh, BDD behavior driven development. It's written in Ruby. It's using Gherkin. Gherkin is a, a syntax or a language that's specifically for Cucumber. It doesn't work anywhere. Okay. 
and commonly used for design, documentation, regression. So if you want to design a feature, you drop out certain sets of um, tests. Not we call it not tests, it's more on the story and also documentation, what's behavior it should work, and then regression. Once your um, app or your program getting larger, you rely on this sets of um, cucumber scenarios to make sure your app doesn't go unexpected like haywire. So it should work as it should before you make any upgrades or changes, right? So again, Cucumber is not a testing tool. So people are like confused. Cucumber, is it a testing tool? Testing tool is like RSpec. RSpec is a testing tool. Cucumber is more towards designing feature. For you to design feature that you want, remove the barrier where um, you have a lot of discussion back and forth. I don't want this, I want this, I don't want this. And then in the end, you drag a lot of time to finish a product. So this is a, um, a framework or a tool for you to lay out what is the agreed feature that this team should work on, right? Rather than, okay, back and forth. I built this, I don't like this. It doesn't work. I didn't test, scrap it, redo. So this will make sure everyone stays in the same page, everyone agrees with it, it's more on the story. So this is getting from uh, creator of Cucumber. So Cucumber was born out of frustration with ambiguous requirements and misunderstanding between people who order the software and who deliver it, right? So, so Cucumber is not just for Ruby. For any yeah, it can be used for any platform because it's just a tool to test your endpoint. So it can work anywhere. Right? So what is Gherkin? So it's a business readable, domains, domain specific language and able to express feature in the natural language. It uses these three keywords, given, when, and then. Right? So it's also available in 60 language. So you can write in Malay, you can write in Japanese, whatever language you want, it works, right? So from here, you can see it's in VM. If it's an N, it will be done. If the background, it, call, it will call Lata Barakang or yeah. And then that's the Malay version of it. So this is the feature file for Cucumber. So first you write a feature, then you describe the feature. What does this feature do? Then you write the scenario. Also the description, the scenario description. So given that a user opened the website google.com, when he types timer for one hour and he presses the button search, then he able to use the timer. He able to see the timer and the timer is counting down from one hour. So you can see that three keywords, given, when, and then. So given is a baseline. So it's like the setup for the environment for the user to go in. So when is the user action? And then that is the response, right? So from here, it's more towards business. So given certain things, when the user do certain things, it should give certain response. So it's very user story-like and it works when you run it, right? So feature will have a bigger pictures on what this feature does. Um, scenario will have test case um, behavior. So this is the explanation of the keyword scenario. Given, set up precondition, when, perform action, then is verifying outcome. Okay? So this is a sample um, feature file. The same thing, you have a background right now. So this is another keyword called background. So background, it's uh, a scene, uh, how to say, a setup where every scenario it will reset itself to the background. So let's say you need to um, open a browser every time before a user will need to click right. You don't want to repeatedly specifying inside given, right? You want it to be there when you start doing your scenario. So you do it in your background. So setting up states condition before any scenario runs. It also runs in the before hooks. Okay, so the red color. So this is the 
fun part. So you know what's Gherkin, right? Gherkin is more English readable storyline, right? So on the left hand side, uh, right hand side is actually the parsing of the text that you wrote. You can see it's using a regex. So given that entity name name, then you do certain things. So this is what we call a step definition. So a given is actually a step. So like step one, step two, step three, right? Given is a step where you define it, how you want to use that step, what information you want to get from that step. I want to get the entity out of that step. I want to get the name out of that step. What I want to do with it. I want to load from a picture, load from the um, predefined entity that I already push it into the database or do things like that. And then I create entity. This is all the Ruby functions that you want to call when you do a step definition. Right? So this is an additional glossary for Cucumber. So that's hook. So for hook, um, you can tell Cucumber to do certain things before a test to run, uh, not the test, before Cucumber run or after Cucumber finish. So basically, if like the Cucumber is um, finished, right, you want to tear down the whole um, database after the test is finished running, you can do that in the after hooks or the before hooks. You want to initialize some data, you want to push in some fake data, you can do that also, right? So um, something like tag hooks. So in Ruby, there's a tagging. You use add. So we can use tagging to run certain functions, right? Maintainable cucumber. So this is the structures that we use. First, we have uh, feature files. All the feature files is just like that. The you remember when a user opened the browser, something something like that, right? That's all the feature files, all the stories that you want to write. You put it in the folder. Next is the step definition. The step definition is the one that you regex the steps and do actions. Helpers. Helpers are the Ruby methods that links to your backend. So you abstract that out of the step definition. So that's three layers. First, you have the feature files where it's written by anyone in the product team. You can let anyone to design the features. You let them write it in any language, it will work. Step definition is the one who um, communicate between the, the helpers and the feature files. How, what does that step means? What information you want to extract from it and carry out what task, right? So you can have when user Adam clicks button. So clicks is an action. You can generalize it. Rather than click, you can do uh, hover over or whatever. So that action will actually give a different output. It will trigger different helpers. So step definition say if action equals to click, trigger, do click. Else, if um, action equals to hover, do hover. So all this do clicks or do hover will be in helpers where those um, functions or definition will actually triggers um, the methods in your backend or in your actual product. And fixtures is all the data model stuff and hooks and configuration. So um, keep your step definition clean. So use a helper class or variables. Don't put everything in your step definition because some somebody just doesn't want to have another extra layer called helpers. It just throw everything in the step definition. In the end, we'll have a very long step definition where it's very hard to read and very hard to refactor if you have more scenario coming in. Um, step calling other steps. So it's like you have a given step and a when step, right? Your given step can actually call other steps also to save your time but it will deprecate soon so don't use it there's a shortcut for this um, there is a YouTube channel uh, YouTube video about this down there so how we make use of Cucumber in um, on app 
So we draft user story ac according to Gherkin. So the product manager will write his story, the feature story, according to that format. Given, then, uh, given, when, then. And then, um, write scenario before and during development, run Qgubber again, development branch, and build in server, and build server, and regression checks afterwards. So we still use the same Qgubber um, framework to check against whatever we add in. So if we add a new feature on it, that will serve as a regression check to make sure the behavior actually works correctly. So my experience is on Qgubber, the painful part of using Cucumber is a convention. So in different teams have different convention of writing things, organizing stuff. So for new joiners, they need to learn how to do it in do it in certain way. So it's very hard to get into the same mindset to write uh, the correct style so that um, the project in the company can actually grow and expandable because if you just don't care about convention you add whatever you write whatever then it's very hard for people to change when new feature is coming up right and maintenance is also a painful part so what is a good part documentation you don't have to write a separate documentation on all your features the behavior of your app Everything is there in user story. The feature file is in the uh, how to say in actually behavior step by step, right? And also regression. So why should you use it? Um, if you want to brainstorm a new idea, new feature, do it. Use Cucumber, or if you're constantly hitting problem and conflict using development across team, or you just need a single point of truth. If you are work in a software world, right, you know everywhere have a documentation and different versions are different things. So some are true, some are not, some are updated, some are updated. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Where should I find the correct place to this, how this behave? We also have this issue back in our company. So the single point of truth is actually Cucumber. Because we run our regression test, it should behave exactly like that. If you read other documentation, it's actually like outdated because it's not following, it's just people writing it. It's not really up to date, right? And um, you do not need to update documentation of all features, right? Because you just, it's on live with your development. So anything change will be on Cucumber itself. You don't have to just up, update your documentation. So why Cucumber probably not for you? If you have a simple feature with a clear instruction, you don't want to map, add more burden writing these three layers. Your feature file, your step definition, and then the helpers to just do your thing, right? Or design feature that doesn't involve everyone. These parties, if it's not um, involve them, it's just a product owner or just product owner and developers, then maybe it's not a good tool because it's easy for communication. You don't have need to have Cucumber in the middle, right? To uh, handle the communication. Or just one a testing framework. If you want a testing framework, that's our spec. There's um, other framework that's out there. Right? Um, company that uses Cucumber. PayPal, Groupon, um, that one is Amazon, right? Typeform. Yeah, Typeform. So this is the events um, for Cucumber. Um, uh, Cucumber is very hot in London. So um, a lot of Cucumber, de Cucumber developers, they call themselves developers, yeah. Um, they actually write stories for um, testing or business requirements back in London because there's big companies, they have, their business always changes. So they need to have a clear um, feature to jot it down, to discuss. If you want to change, you just change that feature file before going to the step definition to the coding part. So make things finalized in the feature file before you move on. That's also a 
a good um, separation because normally when you do testing right I want to test this then you start coding halfway no I don't want to do this anymore scrap it everything like what so feature file allows you to have discussion with all the stakeholders to make sure everything is finalized before moving on to the development right so those are references that you can use um, agile PDD um, and also the cucumber Ruby. So slides are on there. The cat photos are here. And I, this email doesn't work anymore. Okay, that's it. Any question about PDD? How, how would you share the like feature files with uh, like project managers yep. tend to not be technical people? Correct. So like how do you share it with them? Like how do you like a shareable platform and what's that shareable platform? So for us, um, we use Google Docs. So we need to train them to understand what those three keywords are, right? Given, when, and then. Let them fit into their minds. If they want to write a story, they need to use these three keywords. So when they start to write features, then they'll understand, oh, I need to write this format. And then once it writes that format, we can just put it into Cucumber and then we can write um, the stories. It will fail at first, then stop, we will build it on based on that story. Because if any requirement change, we will refer back to that. You say you want this, it's finalized, that's why we start to build. Because if not, if nothing is finalized, your requirement always change, your project never ends. Yeah, so you need somewhere more finalized. So we discussed to get down all the behavior. So you said you want this behavior. We agreed on it. That's why we work on it. So this is the evidence that you put into documentation also. Yeah, this is like, behavior. Do you like review through the stories? Like after the first Google Docs? Uh, yeah, we need to review through the story. Yeah. Then you write it as the... We need to write down the specs. So the developer will have a, a, how we call a feature, a feature, design doc so we need to design what um, framework we want to use what code what add-on how we want to change our code base we need to write it down and then get reviewed by all the people so, yeah yeah correct right. but first we need to get down to the the story the story and the behavior must be finalized that's the most important thing yeah if you have any question about uh, doubt about like behaviors you can make it clearer you can ask them to add more scenarios anytime so it's more clear. I have a question. Yep. Do you need to use RSpec or MinTest or something else alongside with this or this includes the testing environment as well? You can integrate with RSpec. With, remember the uh, helper class? Yeah. The helper class you can link to the RSpec mm -hmm. if you want to. So it depends on the use case of the company. Um, for purists, just now they said it's not a testing tool, but in the real world, if you want to use it, no one stops you to do it. You can just hook it to Minitest or RSpec, and so that when your story um, runs, it actually triggers the RSpec and make sure things work. But if you don't use RSpec or Minitest, yeah, you still can work on it. You still work. Test. Does it test my application or no? It will text your application. Let me open uh, open my GitHub. I actually have an example of that. Uh, let me search. Where's my repository? So this is the how to start from fresh. So. If you don't know Cucumber is okay, you can do it um, like this. So it's a very simple um, project. So you have um, sample features, um, step definition, and help us. Okay, so let's see what's in the sample features. So something like this. So scenario create a web blog. So given that the website is up, so I make sure the website is up, right? And then I create a web blog with the following details, title, description, and then verify. So then the web blog should be created. 
and uh, web blog should contain this thing. Okay, so now we go and find what is actually the step that's doing that given. So given that the website is up, I run verify website and then I check the response code. Cool. Yeah. And then where is this verified website? It's in common helpers. So you have another layer of abstraction where all your functions can be in here. So you have a separate developers working on this. It's okay to talk to each other. And then you have we you can do it as an API, as an API. So okay, to verify a website, I don't care what you do, I just call verify website, it should verify website. So the code here can change anytime because it's a separate layer right and then you have create so it's a URL then you do a response so it doesn't use our aspect our aspect it's just pure Ruby um, running and then let's see back that definition when so, so like the three parts are separated into three three kinds of Yes, so it depends how you want to format it. Normally, we do this the common when, the common then, and common given. given. Yeah, all this we normally separate. So, you can make it more um, specialized into your objects. So, you have a user folder for the user given, or you have a book or product folder for more organized way of writing it so that you don't throw everything in it, right? And then, yeah, when I create the following details, then I parse it in the JSON and then I trigger a create from the common helpers. And then I'll get the entity. I, I store it in my um, session. So later I will use it in my common then. Then the website should be created. Remember just now we create entity already, right? You store in the that particular test. So you can verify whether the ID is there. It's not there, it means it's not created. And the website should contains, then you parse the string that you're uh, verifying. There's a JSON. Then you compare the entity with the string that you define in your uh, feature file. Right. This is a simple way of uh, writing the feature file. Actually, this can be factor more English way, but for start, this is uh, easiest to start with uh, because it's JSON, easy to read. If you want to make it more English, you can, but you need to write your own step definition to pass those um, variables. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think that's. If you it. have a very complex application, mm -hmm. you will have tons and tons of files, right? Yep, because correct. You have to write down every single. Yeah, the behavior. Mm -hmm. So at, to get started, it's best to start with the new feature that you want to develop rather than implementing everything that you already have. Oh, okay. Yeah, start with things that you plan to implement and slowly build up from there. Yeah, still, um, still keep your existing testing framework there, <laughs> but depends the use case. But um, somehow, um, some of the developers doesn't like cucumber because it's troublesome to maintain. If you have more a lot of people to use, it's best because each people, um, each certain group of people will focus on certain layers rather than one person doing repeated work. Everyone jump, 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 jump. So if you don't have much developer. Cucumber might be a pain to maintain. Yeah. If you have a lot of developer, then they can focus on certain part of the layer. Yeah. So yeah. Um hello swimming Tristan. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. Yeah. wow. That's it. Wow. Yeah. So um any anything that you want to share about Dev Kami to the group here? No, not really. Oh, you want to know about the open data 
Oh, open data hackathon the Penang one or which one? I thought there was a one online one from KL. There's an open hack data hackathon in KL? Uh, they are yeah, making it online, I think. Do you know about it? Swimming, do you know about this? Swimming, your mic. Mic is not working. <coughs> is it? Hello? Swimming? <laughs> it's okay. Let him respond. Okay. No, no, I'm sorry, I haven't. Uh... Okay. So, for Penang, we actually have a hackathon. Mm -hmm. uh, hackathon. Yeah. What's called already? Let me open up. So, in Penang, we have a group called Penang Tech. It's more on the free workshop in the BM site, not on the island. So I conduct free workshops for people in the mainland and we have shared information on things that happen in Penang. So there's a hackathon um, government by the Penang government for open data. So actually like there's no sort of information other than the hackathon is happening. There's nothing else. Like you yeah. know anything else. So from here I only managed to get one very clear rule. <laughs> This. So here, this is the comment. <laughs> so for this hackathon, everything that you work on that will hackathon be by the, will be owned by the state government Ooh, exclusively. Everything, the ideation, whatever you do on that, is owned by the government. So that's the catch. Don't do things that you want to sell. Do things that you cannot do by own, but it's more to the government that you want the government to do. Then do it there. So basically, the cash price is quite lucrative. So yeah. So you can do a voting system or a public transport system that you cannot do by yourself. Put there. Things that you want to improve, right? Um. Anything, Fleming? Are you back? No, I'm not video. Hello. You mean? Still, no. You can uh, you mean is is uh, muted, muted or something? Okay. I think filming. I think you need to use your laptop mic. Is it working? Yeah, I cannot hear. It's okay. Then we go to the events that's coming up. So there's a few events in Penang. Um, blockchain event. If you haven't heard of it, you can Google it, it's there. Um, there's a Python meetup in uh, Penang also. We have Docker meetup also. Let's see anything more? Anyway. Oh, right, Is it there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I muted myself for speaking with you. Okay. So, you know, it's a national debate hackathon. Yep. Uh, that one I think you know, it's pretty okay in a way that uh, you own everything yourself. Uh, some data set, if you have to use their data set, but if you upload, they, they actually have to upload to them. Okay. Do you have so, the link? Uh, yeah, I already checked this now. Now my uh, let me uh it's next week, so it's very tight. But the cool thing is it's an online hacker fund, but you have to okay, put up a share on the chat. Yep. Uh it's actually uh, online hacker fund. So meaning you can uh you can be online but on the on next week, no the big plus uh, you have to actually attend a briefing oh. to confirm that you can participate. On the registration, but you have to be available on the on the day for briefing. Okay. So I uh, can be individual with this and if you look at it as uh, you have to use the data set, but the product can be owned by you. I believe the data can be owned by you. Okay. So yeah, that's the national one. 
Oh, oh, oh. So, and it's online, so you do not need to be there other than the day of briefing. Nice. So, yeah. So, that's a national that I have found. So, the sketch is the most same compared to, say. Wait, let me move back a little. It's a little more same compared to uh, on site hackathon two days. I mean, on the other hand, most people have day jobs, so it doesn't really change that much. Mm -hmm. But there's that lah. Okay. Yeah. Major governments open up their data sets. So, they are data sets for you to do things with it. So, yeah. Yep. Pull it down and then analyze what you mm. can do. Yep. So, you can pull the government provided data. Yeah, but the data set is a heap of means. So, just so you know. Some is okay, some is bad. Uh, as usual, because the whole thing is uh, the Open Data Initiative happens to be there and happens to be run by a relatively powerful agency, uh, which currently in a political situation, but let's not go there for now. It's a hit or miss, but some is pretty good. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So, so we'll stop for now. Stop presenting. So nice. loving your t-shirt. <laughs> t-shirt is nice. Yeah, it's about a big white government. So <laughs> you have to able to give feedback, change, and update all various aspects. So huh? Yeah, why not? Why not? It's not the worst idea. In the end of the day, you have to be. In the end of the day, you have to be available. Make changes. You have to be proactive. So it's not just government do everything. You have to do something. Government have to do something. So. Yeah. So let's go to. So that's the NGO I'm working on. See the project. That's that's what we're working on. On transparency, mostly, but also the idea of opening up government for. Various reason. So yeah, you can visit Singapore to know more. Then, do not waste your time. Uh, pick us for our uh, through the website. You can, so you can do some feedback. So that's all for me, lah. Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next session of the talk. Let's see whether I still got it. Or did we close it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now we go for five Ruby tips. Anyone have Ruby tips to share? Anything that from work? Four tips? No? Okay. I didn't prepare. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Maybe next one. Yeah. Yeah, next session. So um, we have RubyCom coming up October 25th and 26th in KLCC. So um, this year there there won't be a red dot in Singapore, so a lot of um, speakers overseas will come to KL. Right? Yeah, red dot is an annual um, Ruby conference in Singapore. Yeah. So this year they won't be doing it. They take a break for one year. So there will be more people coming to KL. If you're interested, go to this link and register. Next is shoutouts. Anyone have hiring shoutouts? Anything shoutouts? Whatever, because we will post it in our group. Anyone is hiring? Uh, my company is looking for visa, but I'm not the decision maker. Okay. Yeah. Ruby. JavaScript. JavaScript is okay. Yeah. JavaScript Java developer. Developer. Yeah. Okay. JavaScript dev for yeah. which company? Bio Energy Projects. Bio uh, energy projects. Energy projects. Uh, to work on Vue.js and Electron. No JS and Electron. Yeah. Uh, Vue.js. Vue.js. Oh, okay. JS and Electron. Or oh, otherwise C sharp. I guess. Huh? C sharp. Yeah. Okay. Anyone? Any shout outs? No? Events? Things coming up? Anything? Because it will post to our Ruby group. So those
didn't attend or actually receive this message of show. <laughs> okay, okay. Cool. So uh, thank you for being here and we'll see you next month, the second uh, Tuesday of the month. So the venue we haven't decided. It might be here, it might be ACAT, it might be anywhere. We will decide when the event's near and we look looking for speaker every time like so we yeah. We have a more successful meetup. Anything from KL <laughs> that want to add well, in? We got a few. Uh, let's see. Uh, we had a JavaScript meetup and DevOps meetup next week. Also, JavaScript, JavaScript meetup is tomorrow. Yeah, oh, it's tomorrow. Damn it. Okay. Then, uh, what else? DevOps on Tuesday next week. Correct. Then we have a coffee session for Python Malaysia. One coffee session because I really I am too lazy to create an official meetup so we just have coffee among Python people. So this on 25th, I think. So yeah. Okay. So anything Tristan? No? So I think we will end here. Thank yeah. you everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So how do I cancel this? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stop the stream, but you don't, don't get out. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank